We're back for another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Mari. And on today's episode of The Spicy Life, we have a fun one in store. She got game. And it's 15 reasons why playing video games is like dating. So this is going to be super fun because to join us in the G spot, that is guest spotlight, we have Alyssa Jacobs. And she is a global entrepreneur and marketing leader in lifestyle and entertainment. She's the CEO and co-founder of Queens Gaming Collective and founder of Loop, a culture first brand studio with 15 years of experience across sports, music, fashion, spirits, and esports. Alyssa drives results from startups to industry giants like Activision, Blizzard, and Diageo. Did I say all of that right? You did. You okay. Did. <laughs> I'm I like, I'm your, busy. <laughs> your, your bio is loaded, girl. You got it going on. You're like the queen of gaming. It's so it's been a minute. Yeah. Thank you so much for like joining us in the studio. I know how busy you are. So, you know, we're going to get right into it um, because I want people to really understand like the gaming uh, games that you play, the gaming games that you play, but then also um, the business behind it and how you are, you know, this, you know, thought leader and this, you know, person who's really making waves in the industry. But then also we're going to get into your dating a little bit too. So to warm you up so you don't get scared. <laughs> You're going to first answer my spicy question. All right. This is my spice breaker. Um, tell us when you first fell in love with yourself. When was this? Wow. You go right. We're, in. Going, we're going deep just to warm you up. I'm here. I'm here. I'm with you, Mari. I, you know what? I think it was twice, right? I think we do it first when we're really young and then we get bumped and bruised and banged around by life. And then you have to fall in love with yourself again as an adult. Yeah. I think that when I was really young, and my youngest memories of it were around like six, seven years old. I really got a sense of, um, I don't know if it was self-worth, self-love, just self-appreciation, but my creator, my creative came out. Mm -hmm. And I really was so incredibly passionate about poetry and art and design and had this free flowing love for people, for my neighbors, for dogs, for anything, right? And I think there was a portion of that that made me feel like whatever I ideated around was a good person or just someone that had something to contribute to the world. I didn't know what legacy meant or impact or any of that, but I do have very vivid memories of like, I think I like me, right? Like I would hang out with me. Yeah. Um, I think in your early and mid twenties, you get, it's different for everyone, but for me, I had those first, you know, toxic bosses, heartbreaks, the things that sort of break you down to your component parts and you have to rebuild. And it took a lot of self-work. It took a lot of journeying back to that place of a deep love for self instead of being your own bad boyfriend. That's like, I love you. You're beautiful. I'm not going to do shit for you. And right. the difference of being in love with yourself and behaving in love with yourself, if that makes sense. Mm, yes, totally does. Um, I'm going to ask you a hard question that, so we can do a comparison. When did you first fall in love with someone else? You know, what's crazy. I was old. <laughs> um, I, I also don't think I realized my first love was a first love until after it had kind of already dissolved um, because I didn't identify what I considered love. And so I was probably in my like mid twenties before I really knew what love was the way I define it. Yeah. I don't think I said I love you back to a man until I was almost 30. So I had a little bit of arrested development. But <laughs> yeah, I would say probably like mid to late 20s. A lot of people can relate to that though. So it sounds like um, there was some falling in love with self first and then you did fall in love with someone else, lost yourself a little bit and then came back to loving self again. Yep. Okay. Normal, healthy, natural progression that we all go through. <laughs> But let's talk about your love of gaming. I need to know like where this intrigue came from. I remember playing Nintendo when I was little. I remember Tetris, but like, I don't know if I fell in love with it enough to make it a career and blow up the way that you did. Where does this love come from? It's the love of play, right? Mm -hmm. It's the love of collaboration and competition and strategy. Um, I love that you mentioned Tetris and Nintendo because one, I'm actually not a good gamer. I'm pretty mm. terrible. I think I peaked at Mario Kart and Mortal Kombat uh, very early, but I learned to pack a car trunk from Tetris, right? Like I learned 
life skills from Sims. My parents thought I was going to be like a city planner or something because I just couldn't peel myself away from the computer. But as I came back to it later in life, it was less about gaming as a game or gaming even as an industry. It's really gaming as a community. And so, you know, I was at Diageo for five years leading culture and partnerships at a beverage alcohol behemoth. And when you are existing and architecting at the intersection of so many verticals of culture, it's music, it's sports, it's entertainment, it's film and television. I led the collaborations with whether it was the Recording Academy and the Oscars or the NBA and New York Fashion Week. It's all the same in terms of emotional marketing. Mm. You're selling celebration, you're not selling booze. And so it really brought me to a place of community and culture and whether that's um, racial, demographic, geographic, passion points, what brings people together with shared interests or commonality. And so as I kind of got the gaming bug early of just out of sheer interest before it became a thing with esports at a mainstream level, you know, I knew a lot of the guys behind FaZe Clan and 100 Thieves and when it was still decks and chicken scratch on a napkin, um, I just was watching it because I'm very much at the cusp of culture. I watch where culture is moving and I watch where um, cyclically and digitally everything was shifting. And so when I left Diageo, I launched Loop, which is a change agency and is all about marketing and PR, but really working with big corporations to make them more culturally relevant, but also hold their feet to the fire for accountability and inclusivity and disruptive startups to start off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. um, Activision Blizzard was one of my biggest clients. So as a senior strategic advisor there, my job was to make it cool. My job was to work with the Call of Duty League launch and Overwatch League and from a product to esports component, experiential, digital events, PR, but really also working with talent and bringing in rappers and musicians and athletes and that collision where they're no longer the plus ones to the party, but they're kind of like partying together. <laughs> and that's really where it shifted for me, where I was like, man, this is everything. It's the marketplace. It's the ecosystem. It's where fashion, music, sports, it all lives here. And as I got more embedded in the culture and the community, then I realized where the massive white space was for women in diversity mm. because it's incredibly limited. It's a lot of the patriarchy's kids. It's like the Jetsons. It's the future, but the 1950s. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask next. I was like, yeah. what the heck? This has been it's portrayed not. as such a male-dominated like sport and industry. How did you, as a woman, like break through and make an impact and like, you know, start making waves? Because we don't hear or see that many women. Yeah. Well, that's the mission, right? That's actually the vision: is fair gameplay for all mm -hmm. and leveling the playing field not just for talent and for the creators themselves, but also for the professionals. Um, there's a lot to learn and a lot to be done in the industry. It's $176.6 billion industry. It's globally more than double film and television by revenue. And it's on track to be 190 billion by end of 2021, 330 billion, I believe by 2025. But the ratio is a bit skewed as you can imagine. And the economic inclusivity, the access to entry, and even the kind of social conditioning and encouragement for women is incredibly limited. Mm. And so for me, I had the opportunity because my business partner, Justin Giangrande, who uh, also started Gain uh, Vayner Sports with Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V, you know, he called me at one point and he's like, did you know that 46% of women, I'm sorry, uh, did you know that 46% of gamers are women? And I was like, yeah, bro, didn't you? Like, it was a really <laughs> interesting conversation because there were two problems. One, he didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Two, I did. And nothing was being done. Mm. And now it's 48%, by the way, almost 82% for mobile gaming. And so when you think about gameplay, why is all the money, all the attention, all the advertising, all the opportunity being both created by and for men, mm. especially white men, quite frankly? And so we did a lot of research and this was like just before the pandemic and it was a business plan on a piece of paper. And over those couple of months, I went from considering being an advisor or CMO to realizing it was a calling for legacy play and moving back across the country, um, divesting a large portion of my company with my business partner, who's a phenomenal partner and 
in trusting her to help lead and allow me to really dive into this. But yeah, it's 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 a lot of work to be done. But um, <laughs> you know, I can imagine there's so much opportunity though, and because our lens for Queens Gaming Collective is talent, content, and product, right? It's management, media, and merchandising as a business model. The movement is very measurable. And the women, um, 22 incredibly diverse gamers, they are esports athletes, cosplayers, streamers, but also crossover entertainers, musicians, models, DJs, designers. They're gamer and, they have different identities. They might be moms or sisters or daughters or wives, and they are phenomena but they also are equity shareholders. They're our business partners. They have skin in the game in the company. So it's not your traditional management model. And then we're creating content with them and we're creating products with them. And it creates opportunities beyond just being the face of because they're also creative partners. So that's where I think the shift happens is when it's the voice in the room and the check, the person signing the check on the back mm. and the front. That makes the difference. Love it. I love it. Okay. For some of us women who are skeptics and we're like gaming though, what are we missing out on by not considering working in this industry or even playing in this industry? What are we missing out on? Give me some of like the, the benefits of being associated with the gaming industry. I mean, aside from the financial component that it's literally the fastest growing multi-billion dollar business in the world, it's really an opportunity to expand anything else that you do love, right? So if you think about during quarantine, touring was dead, right? Music, production, anything to do with the music industry. Where do you think they went? Travis Scott and Fortnite, The Weeknd and The Wave. Mm. Suddenly digital production and entertainment went into gaming. You look at retail, you have the biggest businesses in the world bankrupting, brick and mortar closing left and right. Yeah. Everything was paused, where did it go? Digital, e-commerce direct to consumer, so true. right? Same with entertainment and sports. Why do you think that so many athletes jumped right on into Call of Duty and Live from the War Zone was one of the biggest drops they ever had in the history of the company because it was the arms dealer in the war. Yeah. If you wanted competitive gameplay, if you wanted a spectator sport, it certainly wasn't gonna be in an empty stadium or arena. So I think the biggest piece people are missing out on is realizing that they're already there. You don't have to be a sweaty basement gamer that is putting in 18 hours a night on a first person shooter game or Grand Theft Auto or Dance Dance Revolution. There's casual gameplay too. And as long as you respect and honor the endemic community, and as long as you actually care about having even conversations like this, like people don't realize the greatest dating app is the chat. There's so many people that are connecting in a very male dominated world, by the way right? And actually building relationships remotely because you're spending every night in discord and chat and gameplay and you're connecting because it's like you might not be doing escape the room or paintballing or hiking together, but you're actually learning how each other strategizes and handles wins and losses and yeah. collaborates. So it's an opportunity personally and professionally. I think that women just have to not be so fearful of the men's world with it. Cause guess what? This was also music. This was also sports. This was also a lot of things. It's just catching up. That's true. So true. You're hitting it like the nail on the coffin. There's so many things that we for so long have been kind of like skeptical or hesitant or apprehensive or even held back from being able to enter into. And it sounds like this is the time for us to start like kicking down some doors. Um, I want you to discuss a little bit about the stigma. Um, and I hear this all the time, right? I have like clients who come in um, or consultations that I'm doing and they're like, I want this type of man, but mm -hmm. not the kind of guy that plays video games. What okay. is that stigma? Like why do men who play video games have such a bad like <laughs> stereotype about them as being um, lazy or unproductive or not gonna be able to like financially provide? Where did that come from? Cause I know a lot of successful video gamers that can put it down and got a lot going on for themselves. Where did this come from? So I don't know where the origin story is, but I do think that, you know, as a millennial, right? So Gen Z is a little different, but as a millennial, there wasn't a path forward with video games, right? So boomers, Gen X, millennials, Ninja is a multimillionaire now, right? They didn't have examples of the LeBrons and the Kobe's and the um, superstar athletes 
for gamers Mm -hmm. when we were kids or when we were teenagers or even now, like for (laughs) our generation, right? And I think that um, part of that comes from those that played video games as an adult, as opposed to as a teenager, it was that stigma of like the sweaty basement gamer in their parents' basement because they couldn't afford rent. And like, it is very addictive and in what I consider very positive ways as well, but it's sticky, I'll say, right? (laughs) So when we're talking about Netflix and chill for hours, if you're streaming, if you're gaming, it's probably not like, I'm going to go do that for 45 minutes, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's a commitment of time and it requires an incredible amount of focus. And it's usually a very bro moment, right? Because it's so much of a laundry. Um, (laughs) Get you one that can do both. Yes, clean clothes, folks. Right? I'm like, <laughs> Nastic Diva over here. No, but I, I think that like these guys were almost like the digital fraternity, right? So you picture them like with their headsets on, scratching their balls, grabbing a beer if they had an extra free hand in between kills. And that the things they cared about were shoot 'em ups and Grand Theft Autos and these aggressive games, not necessarily like the Animal Crossings and mm-hmm. Um, feel good Roblox type of stuff. So what I would say is that stigma came from originally some truths because there wasn't that path forward. If you're spending that much time doing that hobby, are you spending that much time dedicated to your craft, your passion, your career, your monetization of your life Mm. or your woman? Like there's so many viral videos of like, you know, like move, like she's like walking around naked or whatever, (laughs) you know? And I think that there's validity in that, I will say. There's some validity in that. But I think what's changed is there's an entire world now that has professional merit, that also teaches strategy and gameplay that has really important life skills. And for me, like, I don't personally want to date someone that's like, has a better relationship with their PlayStation 5 or Xbox than me. But I also want someone that I would choose as an amazing race partner Mm -hmm. that can figure shit out and that has a dedication to betterment, it may not be golf, which I do find probably a little more appealing at times. But <laughs> it's the same idea, right? It's this commitment to long periods of time that you're trying to get better, kind of a boys club. I truly believe it's like the digital golf of our generation. Mm, I love this. Okay, we're gonna start like opening some minds around here. Um, <laughs> one thing that you, we have DM'd about, right? Mm-hmm. Is, um, you had mentioned, and I think that why I was even like, I got to bring you on the show was because, um, I had told you, so I mentioned something in your DM about like dating or something like that, or you had replied to a meme. I can't remember what it was. And I was like, you know, girl, this should be easy for you. And you're like, no, actually, you know, like I wish it was as confident with like dating or love again, as I am with like gaming. I want to know why are we so confident with our career and not so much when it comes to like putting ourselves back out there and being vulnerable in the dating world? It's a great question. Um, I think it was one of your many memes because I totally troll you on Instagram. (laughs) And you always give really insightful advice that as a hypocrite, I often give to my friends as like the resident relationship expert that can't actually execute. Um, And it was something along the lines of, um, girl, you're making me want to get into a relationship to counsel because you're doing it very well. Um, but I think for me, it's not a confidence thing, right? Like, I think that I've done the work and have like had enough success in relationships as much as failures to feel confidence in not only what I bring to the table as a partner, but in my ability to assess whether someone is a right fit for me. Um, but also as a very adaptable Gemini and someone who has varied, versatile passions, interests. I'm a polymath professionally, right? Like I've worked in sports, music, fashion, entertainment, spirits, gaming at the highest level. Mm. So it's not a generalist or a hobbyist. Like I've actually put in my 10,000 hours across multiple categories. Yeah. So in dating, it's interesting. Cause like I could be with a square or a hippie. I could be with an executive or a creative. I could be with different types and find comfort, love, connection. And that sometimes is almost too freeing Mm -hmm. because it's not like, oh, there's only one type, one fit. And so there's that piece. And then I've also made questionable decisions, right? Like I've let myself love or be loved by men that didn't love themselves or 
had a broken foundation that doesn't make them better or worse, but means that we had real misalignment on what, like I said, being versus behaving in love looks like. Mm-hmm. Well, that um, probably one of the last people on the planet that actually believes in monogamy at the literal level. But part of that comes with what you experience as a child, right? Yep. So there's definitely been interfaith, interrace, all different kinds of um, marriage and remarriage in my family. But when I was growing up, all I saw were the healthy relationships. Doesn't mean that was all that was in it, but my grandparents were deaf to, did they part until over 60 years of marriage. And my grandfather was writing a love letter to my grandmother every day since she passed, uh. almost until his own death. And oh, that one always hits. But like <laughs> all the parents, my parents met, were engaged in three months, married six months later, they've been married for 46 years, Ooh. June 1st. So I've only seen people making it work. Yeah. Whether it was a lesbian couple that no one wanted to admit was a lesbian couple because they were of a different generation. Yeah. To inner inner marriage between black and white and Asian and global to interfaith where they literally converted to new religions to create a new mm. foundation for their family. So that exposure is really a blessing, but it also makes you have a really high bar of expectation. And that Disney complex can be as unhealthy as someone that's never seen it and doesn't believe in it. Yep. So true. Kind of like everything else is kind of pales in comparison. You're hitting, you're hitting so many points that I think a lot of people can relate to because not everybody has to come from uh, dysfunctional views of love in order to, you know, not necessarily be where they want right now in their love life. Sometimes it's come, it is coming from this, you know, ideology or, you know, these delusions of grandeur because we saw some amazing things and we want that replicated. And unfortunately, sometimes we're not getting or meeting or choosing um, those or, of partners who can provide, <laughs> who can provide for that. So yeah. I want to not just help you, but help our audience that may be beautiful, successful, got it going on, like you brilliant, just like you, um, that are kind of out there like, Hmm, you know, can this exist for me? Right. I feel like that question comes up often, um, where we have doubts that it exists for them. And so therefore we end up settling for someone who maybe makes us feel good at the moment or for someone who, you know, promises, you know, 20 things, but can only back up like five of them. And we, you know, start telling ourselves, I'm going to focus on my career because Mm -hmm. I get instant gratification from that. And it's within my control instead of focusing and prioritizing love. Yeah. I want everybody doing a juggling act of both. (laughs) So we're going to relate um, the world of gaming to dating and how they're very similar. And I feel like just like how you kill it in gaming, um, there's certain things that relate exactly to like tools of success that we can use for relationships and dating. Okay, so we're going to play a little game. (laughs) For every single one that you are (laughs) every single one that you're able to relate to gaming and dating, I'm going to give you a point. Okay. Um, So I'm going to tally this. (laughs) And of course, I'm going to like chime in and give some spicy tips along the way. But I really want us to have just an open mind about the gaming community out there because um, one thing that I like that you mentioned was that people can meet on there, that it's just as, you know, opportunity driven. Mm -hmm for connections as like these dating apps. So I wanna encourage people to start going on like all of these gaming adventures and trying to meet someone. Um, Okay, so number one, what uh, gaming has to offer and why people love it so much is variety. Okay, variety. Um, There's a variety of opportunities, games out there that you can um, play. It might makes life interesting and engaging. Um, Do you agree with this? 100%. Okay, now you're gonna tell me how there's a variety in dating. Oh, you flipped that. Yep. Um, Get a point right. if you answer this right. <laughs> I love, love a good point system. Um, okay, so like you said, with gaming, there's different kinds of games. There's different kinds of platforms. You can play on console. You can play on PC. You can play on mobile. So it's different venues, different vehicles, different opportunities for physical space. And then also in terms of the who and the what. And so there's all different publishers, all different platforms, right? With dating, it's equally versatile because exactly like I said earlier, you have the opportunity to date anyone or anything that makes sense. And I'm in that weird age now where it's like, 
that the daddy or the son, right? Like there's a <laughs> year weird margin of like 10 years down and 10 years up, understanding the age, understanding different types of personalities of fit, geography, whether you want someone that's like all up in your shit or you like a little bit more distance physically and emotionally. And also just career does come into play, not necessarily the financials of it, which obviously is a part, but also just lifestyle. If someone is more entrepreneurial or more rigid in their executive decisions, mm. how that translates to whether you can pick up on a Friday with panties and a suitcase and go anywhere for the weekend or not. And whether you can have those like midday rendezvous or you need to really schedule date nights with your partner. So understanding that your career is also going to impact as much as your love impacts your career, your career is also going to impact the lifestyle of yep. your love. For sure. I don't know about you guys, but I 100% think we need to give her a point for that. <laughs> really why I'm here. I'm that. just here Good for job. the point. <laughs> <laughs> She's just here for the game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So competency or mastery. Um, competence is made up of feeling mastery or control over something. And many, many video games actually require a skill to play well. So now we're going to relate this to dating. You're going to tell us um, how competency or mastery um, can affect your dating life. All right, I'm going to be really self-aware on this one. Okay. <laughs> because like I said about those 10,000 hours, the difference between competency and mastery is practice. And I would say that for me personally, I don't, practice at all like I'm I'm always in that weird space of like I'm really good single solo mm -hmm. very good at it I have a lot of male relationships in my life professionally and personally I get that that fix that I need of like the testosterone and the energy that I don't necessarily need to be in a relationship all the time mm -hmm. and on the flip side when I'm in a relationship I'm all in know what I want ready for marriage but also certainly not going to play house in between yep so with gaming it's a little tricky because you can be really good at gaming, but if you don't flex that muscle and you're not yep. actually playing, it's going to take a learning curve to actually get back up to that level of mastery. Yep. And with dating, I do believe theoretically, because I have no case study or litmus test mm -hmm. that those that are more open to serial dating or dating around or dating more than one person at once, which I don't know that I've ever done. Mm. Um, allows you to practice and become a master because you're using these people as mirrors yes. and you're able to learn about yourself and what you want, whether it's long or short, intense or surface level. So it's incredibly, incredibly similar. You guys, I may have to hire her um, when she decides to leave the gaming industry because yeah, Lisa, you were hitting yeah, just it. Just that I need one more job. I know, one more <laughs> job. No, but you're hitting it on the money though. So like that was the perfect answer. Um, and what you're speaking to is, um, and I'm going to reiterate this point of this competency. Oftentimes we will experience or have a negative experience when it comes to our relationships and dating and decide that we tap out. We, we messed up, we lost the game, and now we don't want to play again. And what happens is we decide that we're going to focus on these other areas of our life where we know that we can guarantee success or we have more control and we don't dedicate the man hours that are necessary to actually become not just really great at dating, but learn what we like, learn about what connects us with others, practice the mastery skills of communication, of intimacy. So when we go on drought and we decide that we're not going to practice these, now we think that this amazing person is going to come along and we just know how to turn on these skills when they're actually a little bit rusty <laughs> because we haven't been dating. So it really does require you to put yourself out there. And I like the reference that you made between serial daters in the fact that like, while it's not healthy to jump from maybe relationship to relationship to relationship, because you might be also trying to fill a void, um, putting yourself out there and at least consistently dating does make you better at that, does make you better at being in the feminine energy or masculine energy, whichever one you prefer, of pre preparing yourself for a relationship, right? Competence is what I say always creates confidence. So now you're more likely to be more confident when it comes to the vulnerability aspect and learning how to guide someone's emotions. So I love that we're giving you a point um, for, this, for this second one as well. I'm gonna speed through these for you. Um, exploration and freedom. How does this relate to gaming and dating? <laughs> well, in gaming or anything really, right? Because gaming is culture. Gaming is 
anything that you love that has any kind of competition or any kind of play. We're gaming right now. I'm really excited about my second point. <laughs> I am trying to get real competitive actually, but I think that um, exploration and freedom is really important. And like, I'm a super nerd. So like I, I went to college for communication studies and had minored in English language, Spanish and social behavioral. So have like a lot of psychology theory all the time in my head. Um, which is also good and bad and bathing. I'll tell you that much because we psychoanalyze everybody. But I think that one of the relationship dialectics theories that I thought was so interesting always juxtaposed the needs that people have between openness and closeness or spontaneity and freedom versus security and safety. And that there's these dualities that we all need. It's a dichotomy that we want both for everything, right? But the more safe and secure you feel, the more confident and vulnerable you feel, the more exploratory and free you feel. So yes. even from a financial perspective, if you feel like you have stable income, you're going to be more discretionary with a trip or treating yourself to shoes or whatever hobby you might want to invest in, right? If you are in a lack of enoughness and hoarding by necessity or mentality, you're not going to feel as free. Correct. Same with, same with dating. It's like, if you feel safe with someone and like you can be your whole self, you're going to be adventurous and free and exploratory, whether that's like activities or sexually or emotionally more available. Same with gaming. If you feel good about your, you've got this, yep. you're going to be brave. You're going to go try new things. You're going to be okay with the fact that, you know, if you lose, you might win the next one. And you understand that you might be a level 10 on this one game that you're a beast at but everyone starts as an amateur. Yep. You try a new game, you're gonna suck. Everyone sucks at gaming. When you talk about like the competency piece, the only thing about gaming that is the same across the board with dating is the universality of humility. Mm -hmm. Everyone starts as an amateur. There is no race, no gender, no creed, no physicality even, because if you think about sports, you need physical dominance, performative, um, like music, things like that. You actually need a certain gene or some sort of internal intrinsic capacity. Yep. Meaning, I almost said you just need hands, but there's voice activated. There's opportunities for dis disabled. Like you just need to have the desire. Mm. It is complete, like the, the success in gaming is open to literally anyone that's willing to put in the time. And I think dating is very similar if you really want to explore. I love this. And she hit a key word, you guys, desire. I can tell the difference in who really cares about relationships and dating and who really wants it and who says that they have the desire by the actions that you take to support those words. And if I don't say the actions, that is a red flag to me that, hmm, this person doesn't really want it bad enough. They want it in theory, right? But do, are they really willing to do what it takes in order to get it? And this is when the application is so important. So I love that you hit that desire piece. Um, I have another one for you. Okay, risk-taking. You got the point for that last one. You get another one, risk-taking. <laughs> well, I think we just touched on it. You know, risk-taking just has to do with fearlessness. Mm -hmm. I think um, saying yes and yes. also knowing when to say no because the risk is sometimes the opportunity cost. And I think a lot of times those that are saying yes all the time and disgruntled and disappointed and never getting what they want are because they're not having a vetting process. And so they're not filtering and then they're perpetuating the belief that there's no good men out there. There's no yep. good women out there yep. because that belief is being acted on every yep. day. On the flip side, those of us that say no to everything also perpetuate the belief that <laughs> there's no good men or women out there, right? Because you're getting evidence of that belief because you're saying no to everything. Correct. You are saving yourself from any pain, disappointment, heartache, heartbreak. We are also completely foregoing any enamorment or love or lust or experience at the high level. So you might not be manic or depressive, but you're right, they're just coasting. And so being able to take risks, both the risk of loss and the risk of gain is, is big, I think, in any industry and in dating. Oh my gosh. Can we just, I already just know, I mean, you're going to get all these points. You're killing <laughs> it. Like for real, for real, you're killing it. We're going to do a panel on this. Um, just because I feel like the world needs to hear this uh, more mainstream, even in this podcast. Okay. <laughs> Me time. Um, a safe place to fail. How is gaming a safe place to fail? And so is dating. 
I don't know if either feel like a safe place to fail, but I think that it's a safe place to fail because of community. Mm. I think that um, when you find your tribe and find your people, when you also find your sense of home and security within yourself, you've already given yourself proof that you've bounced back. We all are gritty. We all have had that buoyancy at some point, whether it was falling out of a tree and skinning your knees as a kid and actually standing back up in the most literal, simple of senses, or that first heartbreak that feels like you're never going to bounce back. And like, I mean, I was eating liquid Ben and Jerry's at that point, right? <laughs> I remember and those, remember those I days. Mean, you, it feels so big, even if the relationship with the person wasn't that, that monumental to you, the emotions are real. Yeah. And I think that's the pit place that you also have to be okay. Like it's a relative norm. And sometimes I, at least for me, I can diminutize pain because it's not that big. Like mm. if something goes wrong, I'm like, well, this could have been worse or, yeah. you know, look what's happening overseas or like, I'll, you know, I grew up in a household that was very humanitarian and very kind of global in perspective. So if something even happened in school, it's like, well, it's not the same as like the foster kids my dad is working with or overseas in Africa or the vocational uh, college, my mom, you know, it's like, yeah, it never felt big. And so I think the safe place to fail is recognizing that failure is going to feel like failure, whether you missed a token or lost the game, um, whether you don't have a second date or whether you blow up a whole relationship of years. And so just knowing that that safety comes from your resiliency and that you always can have another opportunity. And I think the safety comes from, like I said, your tribe of like, you're all in it together. Yeah. So when you fail, you have community to help pick you back up and get you back on your feet. Just like in dating, you have to, and I think this is harder for men sometimes because they don't want to be as emotionally open with their guy friends as women have that shoulder to cry on. But they've been socially why, conditioned to. Yeah. Not as acceptable. Right, which is why they're, the philosophy... I won't generalize for the entire male population was usually to get over someone is to get under someone else. Right. It's, it's a crutch, right? So yeah. I, I think that safety comes from both your own sense of like, I got this, I can come, I can bounce back from a, from an L um, and the humility that everyone has now. And I think <laughs> also that, that tribe to kind of help uplift you, which, which you are to someone else in every aspect of your life, but don't always want to ask when you're the one down. Okay. So you're getting points all across the board. You are killing this. Next, you're going to tell us competition. How does competition play into gaming, but also competition in the dating industry? How do you think those relate? Yeah. I mean, competition in gaming is pretty straightforward, right? Like somebody wins, someone loses typically, mm -hmm. uh, unless you're in a world building game. In dating, I think it is the competitive nature with yourself to always be like up leveling, upgrading, progressing. And then in honesty, I think it's when you are dating around, it's the competitive nature of men or women with each other for on some level courtship or the prize, whatever that prize might be. It is a competition of sorts for favor. Love it. Love it. We're going to speed through these guys because um, we have someone who's very important that is going to have to run. And so for time's sake, because I don't want to kidnap her all day because I could keep her all day because she's so fabulous. We're going to speed through these um, also for your guys' benefit as well. <laughs> okay. Income and career. Most people don't take this into consideration so much when it comes to gaming, but they do when it comes to dating. Uh, but how does income and career play into gaming and also dating? I think in gaming, it's just, can you create income in a career? If you're mm -hmm. going to do it as a profession, where is that tipping point? Yeah. Between recreation and an actual conversation about career. Um, and I think that for dating, you know, it's interesting because there's extremes to it. You either have someone that it's the most important thing to them or the least important thing to them, but either way it affects your lifestyle and your choices. So I think being a little bit more equally yoked or evenly matched is becoming more important in this day and age. Yep. And I think that no one wants to feel like a bum that is begging for yep. their own allowance. And no one wants to feel, I think sometimes men do, right? But I think that's a social conditioning. I, I honestly think that at the core, most men don't want to feel like a piggy bank. And while that might make them feel needed and they want like submission or whatever, for the most part, you want someone that can up-level you. So I think right. income and career matters um, more as I've gotten older. I used to be like very whatever about it, but it has to be where someone feels successful and solid, whatever that level is to them. And I love what you're saying because 
um, especially with millennials, when we look at the research and the data when it comes to dating, the actual wage gap is starting to close more with how we're choosing partners as millennials, where before with like somewhat of X, but mostly baby boomers, there was this huge wage gap between like husband and wife. And now we're starting to like actually assess like, no, <laughs> what are you bringing to the table if you want me to settle down with you? But we've also never seen us as women make so much in our life before as well. So it's starting to play even more to us wanting someone who, you know, is like you said, equally yoked. So I love this point because it does matter. It does matter that you can provide because if you can provide, we also feel secure and vice versa, men as well. They don't want to be 100% you dependent on them. Mm -hmm. um, next one, build and create. How does the gaming industry um, allow you to build and create and then building and creating when it comes to relationships? In gaming, you're building and creating worlds. You're building and creating physical product if you're on the back end of publishers and developers and making the actual games. Yep. In dating, you're, you're creating a life with someone. When yeah. you come together, I don't care if you're dating casually, it's a vacation fling or your future husband or wife, that moment in time, you're architecting at an intersection and it's something new. And so you're bringing your bricks and mortar, you're bringing your milk and cookies, whatever metaphor you wanna use, but you're making something at that intersection. And I yes. think that's where it's really similar. Another point for her, this next point, she actually already touched on earlier, which is building relationships. You had mentioned that you can build relationships through the gaming world. Mm -hmm. And now when it comes to dating, also building relationships is of, of course, you know, huge when it comes to the dating component. Are you guys willing to build those relationships and communicate with someone and share with someone? So I'm gonna move on to this next one because she already talked about building relationships. So we already give her a point for that one. Relaxation, how does gaming give relaxation and so does dating? Oh, I don't know if either does. No, I'm just- <laughs> <laughs> Come on now, uh, how do you want ooh. this point? Sheesh, no, I think, listen, like it's an escape, right? Like when you're yeah. gaming, you're enter literally entering another world, another metaverse. And so there's that disconnect and that detachment and that ability to go be whoever you wanna be in that other world. Yeah. In dating, I think, the relaxation comes when you're with the right person, frankly, when it's yes. stressful and tedious and anxious, you're probably not dating the right person when it feels safe and light. And like, you can just let your hair down and breathe and maybe be a girl, not just the woman in charge all the time. Yeah. That relaxation really just comes with exhale and someone that allows you to just be still and have peace. Yes. I love it. Okay. Give you another point. You get another point. Excitement. This is where like passion comes into play. Yeah. How does passion come into play and excitement, gaming and dating? It's the thrill of the kill, regardless of the type of game. It's the points. It's the, you see how excited I get on these like made up points. It is that, <laughs> the win. People want to feel the win, right? And so in dating, I think that that can blur the line with infatuation and lust versus love and stability, but you still want that excitement. So even if you have something stable and more mellow, because most of my married friends, married someone that had a lot less excitement in the upfront and <laughs> less than some of their previous passions, I will say. Um, but I think you still need that. You need someone that gives you butterflies or makes your heart pace and race and just like has newness all yeah. the time. Yeah, for sure. Giving her another point. We're almost done. We're speeding through this for her. Autonomy or independence? How does gaming and play into autonomy and independence yeah. and dating? Depends what kind of game you like, right? So if someone is really into autonomy and independence, they're probably gonna play a one-to-one -one game more often than a quad or a squad or a team-based game. And you don't necessarily wanna be reliant on someone else or like a group project that you're gonna have to carry, right? Oh, don't miss those. <laughs> dating, which also should not be a group project for the record. In dating, <laughs> it really comes down to how much independence you want to feel both in your life, right? Like what you can handle and not need from someone else versus what you choose to want and need and let them provide. Um, but also just your spirit, like autonomy has to do with agency and self-reliance, but also decision-making. Yep. And I know we're close to time, but I have a really funny short story. So I was at <laughs> years ago and my sister who is now married to this lovely Frenchman and lives in London with my baby nephew, um, it was the first time she brought him to meet the family and my great uncle, who's hilarious and thick New York accent, um, our last name is Jacobs. And so 
he said to him, he's like, hey, Arno, he's like, you like making decisions? And you know, Arno's like, he's very French. He's like, just meeting the people. He's like, I mean, yeah, I guess so. He's like, well, you marry a Jacobs woman. It's the last decision you're ever going to have to make. <laughs> and it was this hilarious moment. But I think that comes down to like also choice, like what decisions you're making as a couple and how much you want that to be as a couple mm-hmm. and how much you want that to be for you by you. Mm. Love that. Yes, you're hitting it. Okay, I've got two more for you. Measurable progress. Gaming has measurable progress and so does dating. Yeah, gaming is a little more literal because you can see it on the points, uh-huh. right? Um, so unless you have like a really creepy tally system, which I hope most people don't, I don't think it's quite as literal of metrics and KPIs in dating. But I do think at the simplest level, it's are you moving forward and upward? Are you progressing through the game? Are you getting better every time? So if you date the same, basically the same guy three times over for 10 years to learn a lesson, (laughs) um, like, is that progress? Not necessarily. They might be a little better each time or it's different qualities or you learn this thing and then deal with that thing. But just knowing that each time you're in a new relationship or choose someone in your sphere that you've gotten better and that they're whatever better means to you, right? But that you're upgrading and up-leveling every single time. I think it's a progression. It's not just a, you know, it's not so black and white. It's yeah, just it's a progression forward. of healthy choices. That's how you would measure yeah. it. Like, yeah. it, am I in a healthy relationship each time? Each relationship, you guys, should get better than the last. If you're not noticing that that's happening, you need to come to me, okay? Uh, <laughs> and this is the last one uh, for Mrs. Jacobs over here. Um, gaming is fun. You're going to give us uh, why gaming is fun and how dating is fun. And let's see if you can really convince us of this one. <laughs> no promises. Um, <laughs> well, gaming, gaming to me, it's like, again, I like the word play. There's a playfulness. Like as an adult, a lot of times, and I think this is why you see people even like when they're dating younger or they're dating someone in a career that's like much more um, playful or light or entertaining than theirs they're seeking that, they're seeking that return to play, that return to youthfulness. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something really fun about that in gaming where no matter why you're in it, it's just, you're playing, you're literally playing. I don't care if it's board games, I don't care if it's Jenga, I don't care if it's, you know, um, Fortnite or Activision Blizzards, you know, Call of Duty, it doesn't matter the type of game. You just get to release and play, whether it's competitive, collaborative, it doesn't matter why, you really get to just let your inner child out, which I also think goes back to your original question of like, why are women less attracted to like gamer, gamer men that aren't Uh professionals, right? But that's because there's that youthfulness, which also can feel like immaturity at times. Um, And then on the flip side, I think that dating should be fun, right? Like it should be a bit more gamified than many of us make it. And it shouldn't be taken as seriously as everyone needs to be the one or throw the baby out with the bathwater. It really can be experiences with people. And if it's safe and healthy and productive, like you should do more than just go to dinner. You should get to know people. You should have shared life experiences. You should have adventures and, and play together. And I don't necessarily mean digitally like video games, but what does it look like to play with another human? I think you learn a lot more about them than anything else you can do. It's not going shopping or a Michelin star restaurant. It's how do they actually show up? And that's to me, should be really fun. (laughs) I love this. Okay. I know you have to run, but there was one more point that I missed that I wanted to see if you could just touch on real quick. Collecting. How is gaming allow you to collect things and dating and relationships allow you to collect as well? Can you just do that one really, really quick? And then we'll have exactly 15. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> for investors. Um, that said, yes, I think that collecting for gaming is you're so you're collecting within a game too, right? Like you're literally there's microtransactions. You can buy skins, win coins, medallions, whatever it might be. So there's a literal sense. It's also collectibles culture. There's this kind of geek culture, nerd culture that's similar to sneakerheads with like figurines and um games, comic books, right? Like people want to have physical memories of things and also a repertoire, right? Like it's the variety going back to your other question as well. 
with dating, I mean, I hope people aren't just collecting, you know, body <laughs> count, but I do think that there's a collection of knowledge, a collection of experiences, a collection of memories, and also a collection of just growth, like really collecting growth opportunities with people. And if you are not a superlative to anyone that you date and they are not a superlative to you, there's mm. a problem. You should be an er or an ist in something and it, it is a trade. It shouldn't just be like collecting t-shirts and sweatshirts, which are great girlfriend perks, but it should really be collecting knowledge about yourself and, and just love and experience. Expansion. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. She just murdered this game. When I say she got game, I really mean it. She <laughs> got game. Okay. <laughs> and she did this in a time crunch. So we really appreciate you. You'd like nailed all of these points. And I think that you related them to gaming so much that now anyone who doubted gaming is about to try it or at least try to play it with their boo. Right. Or be open to men who game. Um, mm -hmm. And fellas, maybe you're open to women who are gaming. And then also now open to dating, like being under able to understand how this is more of a game and not so much pressure on ourselves to where it's painful that we can now enjoy this experience and process. And that's why I wanted you to come on this show. So you have to let everybody know because we have to close out because you got to go and make some more money. Um, <laughs> we're going to close out and you're going to let everybody know where they can find you if they want to join, if there's an application process, how mm -hmm. can they enter into your world? Let everybody know where they can find you. Well, first of all, I think you just like sneak counseled, which I'm totally into, but also <laughs> I was like, it was actually a therapy session that you tweaked. Um, but I, on, on personal platforms, I'm at Ginger Jacobs, as you know, because just learned I have a government name. Um, that's G-I-N-G-E-R-J-A-C-O-B-S on Instagram and then at Alisa A. Jacobs on Twitter. Don't use it as much. And uh, for Queens, we are at Queens GG. That's Q-U-E-E-N-S-G-G -G on all social platforms, every single one, and queens.gg if you want to learn more. And at the end of the day, it's a management merchandising and media company. And our goal is to be the WWE of gaming and really create space for diverse women and BIPOC creators and expand the economy for it. So reach out anytime. Um, and I'm excited to keep talking to you. I love it. Thank you so much for joining us. You guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my IG at Spicy Madi. Go to the spicylife.com, schedule a free consultation, um, download this episode as well, the Spicy Life podcast, share it with a friend, click and subscribe. And there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The Spicy Life.